Uh, before lunch, Ingrid and I are going to do like a, a chat, and uh, it probably makes Ingrid a little bit nervous that we have not talked about what any of our questions are going to be. As you can see, I didn't bring any questions, uh, and if you've met before, I don't make things ahead of time. So let's do this. Uh, we're going to, I want to kind of like introduce you by way of a uh, true-false game. Okay. Uh, so which of these things have you done, true or false, uh, <laughs> national cycling champion? Do they answer or do I answer? You. Oh, that is true. If they know the answers, <laughs> we're done already. Okay. Uh, we don't have to ask any questions. Uh, so that one's true. Uh, software developer? True. Uh, started a company? True. Sold a company? True. Techstars mentor? True. Uh, Merge Lane mentor? True. Chair of a nonprofit? <laughs> true. Uh, mom of twins. True. Are there any falses here? Uh, <laughs> is Marty our friend? Uh, True. <laughs> soft answer, soft answer on that. Uh, like general overall, like badass. True. true. Okay, true. True. Okay. Oh, nice. uh, so, so like a lot of different topics that, uh, <laughs> that, that I think are interesting, but, you know, one that always stands out to me is coming from a software development background into business running, business creating. Uh, can you tell a little bit of the story of when y'all were programming and then decided like, mm -hmm. we could, this business thing, it can't be so hard, like we could do this? <laughs> we did say that actually, yeah. unfortunately. What did that look like? You know, it's funny, um, so when I go to speak at code schools or at CU, uh, you know, computer science department, one thing I, I make sure to say every single time to the women in the group is that you have to be really careful about um, making sure that you stay in engineering. If you really want to be an engineer, you have to make sure that you stay in because women tend to get pulled out into other things like project management or organizing groups or all these things. And so in my career, I've definitely um, had to resist that and I've had to, um, you know, tr I've tried it out. I was a, you know, director of engineering in my past. And so when we started Quick Left, you know, it was three of us, we were all developers. Um, we were all writing code, and it it came to a point in my career where I felt like I was interested in trying um, something a little different. So I kind of went over to the business side, and it and it was it was good because it was something that I chose, and I was excited about it. Um, but it was really hard as well because um, when you don't write code, you don't really have a sense of accomplishment, or when you're making that transition. So, you know, I. You can really feel good about yourself when you get through a bug or you you make something work. It's harder to feel good about yourself until you practice um, about solving a, a people problem or, or something like that. So I would go through the day and all I did was meetings and email and I wouldn't feel that sense of accomplishment. So that was, I think, the hardest thing for me to transition into um, being a developer and then having a business was just feeling like I actually did something. Um, and eventually, I just sort of made light of it. And when people ask me what I do, I say email and meetings and show up to stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when you were first starting out and it was just the three of you on day one, did you, was it hardest to manage the clients, which maybe day one they didn't exist, uh, the team or the business? Um, it was definitely the clients, and I actually have a funny story that I hadn't thought about, and except for that I ran into Ryan Cook earlier. He's um, at Curly, so we actually started out as a PHP shop, um, and we hired. That's not funny. <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> That's, I know. And we hired Ryan, and um, you know, two weeks later, when he started, we said, "Guess what? We're um, not going to write PHP anymore. We're going to switch over to Ruby." Um, so you know. There was a lot more in the in the beginning. Um, there was a lot less need to really manage the team because the people that we hired early on were very self motivated. Um, you know, they didn't really. You know, Ryan didn't like walk out because we told him that he was going to learn a completely new language. In fact, the first three uh, hires that we took from your school were. Um, did not not any of them did Ruby when they started. We did uh, JavaScript and iOS, so they all had to do languages that they had no Surprise. idea <laughs> how to do. Um, and so yeah, so in the beginning, it was really more that the clients were the hardest to manage, and it was us figuring out what our angle was. You know, um, 
we had to make those decisions like, were we going to be on call if they emailed us at 2 in the morning? Were we going to um, do midnight deploys? The answer to all of those things, of course, is no. Um, and, and I think it, that's a, a more, uh, it's expected more that you don't do those things now. Um, you want to do a deploy when people are fresh and can respond to issues. Um, but in the beginning, it was really, we were still really educating clients um, about our process and, and figuring out what it was and how we defined ourselves. The managing the team, you know, we went from being a flat organization when we started, and that worked really well for us until we got to about 20 people. And then, you know, people started to wonder um, how do I advance in my career? How do I get from being a junior to a mid to a senior? Um, and so then that's when we started to have to pay more attention to um, more people problems, career growth, uh, implementing a hierarchy, not to create bureaucracy, but to create more structure. Um, a flat organization works really well if you have a certain kind of person, but that doesn't give you necessarily a, uh, the opportunity to have a diverse team. And so those were some of the ways that uh, we transitioned from not having to worry about things to having to worry about quite a few different things. Ton of pieces I want to dig into there. Uh, as you got started, when was the first time you got paid? You know, we because we are a services company. You know, so Quick Left was uh, you know a dev shop agency style. We actually, um, well, when I first met my two co-founders, they were not getting paid. <laughs> so. Um, that is one thing I kind of was able to offer was, you know, tightening up our contracts and, and really, like, I think I learned this from being, uh, you know, I got my graduate degree in women's studies, and so you have this whole notion of, of understanding your value and, um, and kind of asking for what you're worth. And I think as developers of all genders, we can sometimes not value our worth and we can have a hard time like we, we only think we're valuable when we're typing on the keyboard um, and we shouldn't bill uh, if we're going to the bathroom or, or taking a break. But you know, you're thinking about the project the whole time. And so that's sort of the angle I brought um, to, the, to the group when we um, founded the company. And so what we ended up doing um, and enabled us to not have to take funding when we started was uh, we would get payment up front um, from our clients. And that was what also allowed us to um, get some cash surplus to have people quit their perfectly reasonable, well-paid jobs to come work with us, <laughs> which is really scary. The upfront payment thing I think is super interesting and having worked on my own, like have made those mistakes. I was just uh, telling Dave a story last night where one of my clients who uh, is enormous, like the bigger the company, the longer they take to pay. Yes. And, uh, my net 30 invoice they paid in 280 days. Yeah. And when you're sitting around like, hey, it's just me and I'd love to pay this um, you know, rent. And then they're like, well, we're, oh, it's, it's, it's about to get paid. And then 200 days yeah. later it gets paid. That's very not fun. Um, the getting paid up front, I, I think can sometimes feel like advice, like, oh yeah, I would get paid up front, but they'll never go for that. Right. And like one of the, did you all have any like tricks in getting a front, or I shouldn't say tricks, strategies. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're right. A lot of companies don't go for it. And, and our strategy was that we weren't even big enough to contract with those kind of companies yet. And so it is true that, you know, as you kind of go for those larger contracts, um, you don't have a lot of say in, you know, the payment terms, or you might not even have a lot of say in the contract terms and it's kind of up to you in terms of how much risk you want to take on. Is it worth having their logo on your site or is it too risky for your business um, if something happens and it takes uh, 200 plus days to get paid. So our first clients were more kind of um, angel funded types um, who, who are actually great at paying because mm. they have their cash. Yeah, Small people, they tend to either have no money and yeah. then they're, they, they don't pay it to you. Um, or you give them the invoice and they pay you right away. Yeah. It's kind of like waiters and waitresses are the best tippers. Mm -hmm. um, they, they kind of understand what you're going through. Uh, eventually figured out a strategy for my business, which was to raise prices 10% and then offer a 10% discount for prepayment. <laughs> and Those were great tricks, like, actually, it's, it's to artificially fabulous. raise yeah. the, the prices and then offer 
a psychological discount. Yeah, people love discounts. Anything totally. discount, they're like, okay, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> what, like, how, speaking of kind of pricing and so forth, and there's three of you, and you're like new kids on the block, and then you're like, we will charge 800 an hour. Like, how, how did you, that was not the answer. Um, how did you figure out like how to price those initial things when you had no particular reputation as a company at least? We actually got our inspiration from a talk that OV did at Hash Rocket where he was talking, and this is a very old talk and probably many of you have seen it, but he was talking about how as developers we should all charge 150 an hour. Um, it doesn't matter if you're freelancing or whatever, we all deserve this amount. Um, and this is, you know, we started in 2010, and this talk was probably... So that's like $400 an hour <laughs> in today's dollars. Unfortunately, as, as maybe we'll later talk about, in this uh, geography, the prices kind of have come down a little bit. Um, but anyway, um, so we, we did a lot of research. We modeled our company a lot off of other places that we admired, like Hashrocket and ThoughtBot and Pivotal. Um, so we had a lot of good um, examples that have sort of paved the way for us. So if I'm in the audience and I'm a developer and I've been doing this for five years and, I'm, and I've been looking at these managers like, I could do that, uh, what's the thing I'm most likely to mess up in that initial, in, in the first like 45 days? Um, I don't think you'll mess up in the first 40 to five days if you have that attitude because I was certainly that in that same boat. I mean, I've only worked, um, I've always been a very early employee at every place I've worked. And I've so I've been able to kind of see how these people have, started companies and I learned a lot about you know just initial starting things where you'll mess up is going to be later when things get more complicated dun, dun, dun. and you have all of these judgments about you know why your boss did something and how stupid they were and then when you're the one on the other side I mean there were times where I was like oh my gosh the whole dev team is going out and gossiping right now I can see it <laughs> And I remember when I was that person, so yeah, karma. <laughs> <laughs> so you start out the three of you, uh, you hired the fourth pretty early on, and was there a vision of like, we want to be 12, we want to be 16, or was it like, we just want to not be poor, like we just yeah. want to make get the ball rolling <laughs> so and like see what happens? Well, it's so funny. So for me, um, it was really important that we had health insurance from day one because um, you know being a competitive cyclist, uh, you know there's things that could happen and you could be in really big financial trouble. Uh, in fact, one of my friends is a Olympic level sprinter, and she in a training ride um, got crashed out and, and almost ended her career, and she didn't have great health insurance. So you can you know you just don't want to play with that. So so our first like number had more to do with the fact that with Trinet we had to have five people on the insurance plan. <laughs> we could get to five like anybody. <laughs> so we Just made five it, people. So we can be insured. And Were you so tempted we, to pretend to be two people? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, we got... Well, you know, we had some good projects, so we were able to do that pretty easily. And I, I was very proud to say that we had insurance early on, but it was kind of funny when I went back to my graduate school. They had their 40th anniversary. Um, San Diego State was the first graduate program in women's studies in the country, believe it or not. And they had students come back to talk about how they applied their feminism. And everyone was like, yeah, I work in a nonprofit for nonviolent self-defense, and I'm writing a book and getting my PhD. And I, I was like, I have health insurance at an eight-person company. And it was like crickets, tumbleweeds. It was the crickets of envy, though, because they were like, that's like, awesome. You know, why wouldn't you? And so, so I think it's... It's hard for people to realize that that is a big deal. And I, I think, you know, even when in the news they're talking about raising the minimum wage and all these reasons why small businesses can't do it, I, I wonder, you know, they should. Because if you have somebody on your team who crashes or gets hit by a car or something happens, and then imagine as a small business what happens, the ripple effect of that for your business, for the morale of the team, it's it's like the few extra dollars that you're spending to get people insured is, is it's worth it. It's funny with some of those pieces that are almost taken for granted, or I think particularly when you're like in your early 20s are taken yeah. for granted. I was talking to a friend who works at one of the largest consultancies kind of in our space, and uh, they were griping that the amount they individually pay for their health insurance had gone up. And I was like, you have to pay for your health insurance? That's crazy. Yeah. Like this is a like a billion dollar company, 
why are you paying for health insurance? And they're like, well, this is what we have to do. And it's like, yeah. they, they don't, those choices don't have to be that way, right? And it's kind of interesting, like, I, th I think about these kind of hygiene factors of employment, and it's, it's weird how dollars aren't always dollars, right? Like, $50 here and $50 there, and, like, the feeling of I have to pay for my health insurance is kind of just one of those, like, ugh. I would rather get health insurance and get paid $500 a month less or $300 a month less or whatever and just not have it on my mind, right? It's like it's just a part of like taking care of people. When you were trying to get to five and get to eight and get to 10 and to 12, like what were you doing to try and shape the culture? And by that point, I think you were, you were, you were kind of running the ship, right, among the three partners. Yeah. And the other two were kind of like, hey, this is cool. We want to like write the code and do the stuff. And you were like... <laughs> okay, I'll tell everyone what to do. Is that fair? I'll keep the lights on. Yeah. I'm more of a, a coach and less of a tell people what to do kind of leader. And when do you get to yell, though, if you're a coach? <laughs> yeah, see. Back to the computers. No. Yeah. No, it's not my style. But, you know, in a lot of ways, we grew pretty organically. I think when it came to strategy on growth, the main way that we focused on was the more about the kinds of projects that we were taking and less about, you know, the numbers of people. So, you know, we could have added a design team and been really a full service agency or, you know, there could have been a number of things that we did. And we, we did spend a lot of time um, making sure that we were happy about the direction we were going from, you know, more of an engineering perspective. So we really put engineering first. And I don't know if looking back on that, that was the best idea because I think in the end, um, it, it may have contributed to, you know, sort of what happened uh, and led to us, us selling. Um, being an engineering first company doesn't always mean you're making the right business decisions, um, is, is mainly. Hmm. Um, and one unfortunate thing I learned, and I, it's, it really bothers me, um, but the only people that care about good code are us in this room. Um, <laughs> Investors don't care about it. Um, the people you're writing code don't really care about it until somebody they think is important tells them that the code they have is terrible, and then they kind of care. I, I think they care if they have like a security breach and they are responsible for a bunch of things. But, but it was really, you know, one thing I saw uh, over and over again was just that lack of, of care that um, clients really did have about our craft. Um, and so, from a business perspective, there is a little bit of that conflict with um, us being craftspeople versus can we get this done cheaply and hire a lot of juniors um, to make a better profit. And Yes, hire a lot of juniors. Um, which I do, but <laughs> not to make a profit. <laughs> uh, did you feel like you had to be the, the like bad lady? You know, of like, hey, everybody, I know you want to, like, refactor for four sprints in a row. Um, we got to ship this thing. Uh, not so much because I think we had people that were pretty pragmatic. I, th I think there were times where we had people who did go down rabbit holes. And, um, you know, if, if that happened, you know, sometimes we'd just give a discount on the invoice or something like that. Um, you know, sometimes it's really hard to tell people why they're, what they're doing is wrong until they've experienced the pain themselves. Um, so, for instance, um, I am also old, and so I've also done waterfall. And um, I remember when I was in San Diego, and I was we were working on the San Diego Chargers website, and opening day of football, um, I had to do something to their homepage. And so Sunday, I was by myself in the office because you know there were no left top so I had to drive to the office <laughs> to do this and um, you know like a good developer I tested my changes on the staging, ser staging server before I put FTP my files to the live server yeah, like PHP days and, um, and uh, you know back in those days people were really trying to figure out how to monetize the web so some of the ways they did it were with you know paying for these tools so there was a, a little JavaScript WYSIWYG so normal people could type stuff in like Microsoft Word style, and it would show up in markup. Um, but the license for this tool was only licensed for the live server, and the, but the database connection was to the live server as well. And so instead of testing my changes like a good coder, I actually deleted the homepage. Ship it. Oh. 
homepage deleted. <laughs> football games about to start. People that like football care a lot about football. Thankfully, there were no smartphones. So the people at the football game had no idea. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. So, you know, those are little things that, you know, you, you almost have to experience that pain to realize, like, why Agile is good for you, not a nuisance, why TDD is good for you, not a nuisance, why FTP is just not a good way to transfer <laughs> files over. And so it's, a, some... it's a good way to transfer files, just not to have files. Yeah, right? Right. I, I, I had a friend uh, who ran a small agency in DC call me one day, and he said, hey man, I really need some help. Um, how do you undelete on FTP? <laughs> and I was like, <sighs> No, then you, you know. have this whole folder, subfolder, which you've copied everything, and in case you need to put it back, it's, it's a yeah. total disaster. They had disaster. actually deleted, so they had all their clients on a shared server and had accidentally deleted the root, and of yeah. course, like, didn't have nice. version control or yeah. anything of that nature, so um, that was not good for them, not good choices. So sometimes I think I, instead of telling people, to back to your original question, like, get back to work, I think what I would do instead were... I really did let people kind of walk off the cliff. And as long as it wasn't going to put us out of business or something like that, I, I did stand back and let people just kind of learn on their own. And it always, I think, just sticks with them better. And it's a lesson they can take with them. So, you know, a theme this morning is really, you know, about mentoring. And I think, you know, as a mentor, um, you can't be so quick to jump in and like, no, no, this is wrong, you know, just just sit back and shut your mouth sometimes and just let people kind of go through the, their journey to get to that answer. Did you feel, especially in that small team, did, did you like share the business and the business burdens and the business concerns when you were 10 or 12? Or was it like, I'll deal with all this stuff, you all deal with this coding? I think that things were pretty shared and, and maybe to a detriment because, um, uh, you know, as we grew, one thing I started to notice is that, um, you know, developers maybe didn't have all of the, the right information that, you know, the management team had about a contract. And so sometimes they would get distracted on some of the details of the contract terms in a way that um, kept them out of just delivering the best business solution to the client. So I, I definitely went back and forth between, you know, like at one point we had open books. Um, we didn't have open salaries, but we had open books. And I thought that it would help people really understand kind of how the business works. But if, if they don't really understand how a P&L works um, and some of the bigger picture the profit business, and loss sheet. to your point, mm. yes, the profit and loss sheet, um, it, it is hard for them to make uh, really educated decisions about why we're doing things, and then it again it takes their minds off of delivering that solution. So, um, so yeah, I mean we we've definitely tried all of the above, sharing a lot, sharing less, um, trying it out. I think when you talk about transparency in business, as a software developer or or kind of a, a person in a role where you're doing the work, the feeling is like yeah, transparency. I want to know what's going on. And the problem is, like, it's not always pretty, right? And, like, you're trying to write software, and, and this whole thing about writing software is about abstractions, right? And abstractions on top of abstractions because we can't hold all these details. We can't be thinking about all these details. And if you're trying to implement some application and you're also, like, I'm pretty sure we don't have enough money for payroll this week, right. that's not, like, that's not a good place to be right. doing good work, right? And at the same time, you don't want to be, like, doo, 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 I'm building software, and then everybody's, like, oh, by the way, we have to keep the lights off because our bill is, like, overdue and it doesn't work. Right. Um, charge your laptops at home. Uh, <laughs> so there could be, like, pluses and minuses, yeah. right, to that, to like, or, like, finding the right level, finding the, the right people who are valuable. Like, you, you don't really want information that, you're, that you can't do anything about. Yeah. Yes, and, and you're right. And it, it, as engineers, we are we are always trying to solve the problems. It doesn't matter necessarily what area of life it is in. And so it, it's hard. You know, I really struggled with that natural curiosity. Like, I don't want to keep things from people because it's our nature. But it's really a distraction sometimes. So, yeah, that's a hard one. I want to flip a little bit uh, from the business part to some things you brought up about, like, 
women's studies and feminism and being in tech, and especially as it relates to kind of this like Denver, Boulder uh, area. I imagine it's the case that, as you said, like going to things, like what has, have there been phases where it's like, I'm invited to this thing, and I'm invited to this thing, and I'm invited to this thing, and it's just like, yeah, like I'm the, yeah, I'm the lady software developer, business owner at like every single thing mm -hmm. over and over. And does that feel like pressure, you know, of like, oh, I have to represent my old gender and like prove that women can do all these things or whatever? Um, or is it, does it balance out with like excitement and getting to kind of share what y'all have done? It's, it's not, it doesn't feel like pressure now because there's so many more voices, but when I first, I give a women in tech uh, talk about uh, kind of the data behind how many people are in tech, um, reasons why they might not be, high school, college, things like that, data wise. Um, and when I first started giving it, um, like no one would really come and it was just women in the audience. And by the end, or by the end, I still have given the talk. So, uh, you know, as the time went on, um, more people would come and the rooms would get bigger. So, you know, from my time in graduate school um, till now, it feels like people actually care. And I actually remember having this conversation with somebody um, at South by Southwest one time, another woman in tech, and this was early on in tech too. So it felt like the younger generation was coming in um, more excited. So I, I felt like men on my engineering teams that were younger were more excited to have me on their teams. Um, and so I have anecdotally seen this shift where people want to have the conversations and it's been really great. So I haven't felt the pressure because other people have shared the burden of having the conversations. Whereas, you know, I think in the, in the 90s um, and the early 2000s, you definitely felt like the loner if you brought up any of these issues about race and gender or you might get, uh, and you know, it still happens, but you would, you would get like the email lists would all troll you and now it's Twitter and, and it was really kind of dangerous almost to speak about some of these issues and it, you had to think about it more like, do I want to take this on because people might send me nasty emails or, you know, say they're going to come to my house and, and things like that. And now it feels like... Was that a part like, of your, ex like your personal experience? Not, not so much because when I was in tech, um, I was just trying to be a good developer and, um, I, it, and some of the, the things, sometimes it takes me a while to like marinate on kind of what happened and so I never really experienced anything that I felt like I had to go and talk through um, and so I never had to take that risk, mm -hmm. I suppose. Do you feel like that kind of thinking and those understandings, like did they influence the early days of the company like in concrete ways? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think just specifically more in um, organizational structure. Um, I had worked in collectives and kind of experimented with different uh, styles of, of kind of group structure. So collectives are non-hierarchical and there's you know no structure and that also makes it hard to get things done. Um, and so having some of that experience helped I think to strike a balance with you know, a flat organization that, that can work well. I think we did a good job for a while, but I do, at some point it does become difficult with, um, you know, a diversity of people in their experience levels and uh, with, you know, getting things done focus-wise. Uh, you were on the board, did a lot of work with NC NCWIT um, and kind of advocacy and those things. One of the things that's really interesting to me about some of those issues now is for most people, it, 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 I think most people are convinced that this is an important thing to talk about. Um, I'm not convinced that the action keeps up with the talk. You know, yeah. and do you like, do you see a gap there? Like, how does that play out? What does that mean? Absolutely. I, I think it has more to do with that people are well intentioned <laughs> and don't always even realize what they're doing. So one of the examples that I have from even from Quick Left is, you know, I'm like, oh, I've I got a master's degree in women's studies. I run this company. We we got this. Like we're 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 good. 
And then I started to notice, you know, we, we also had an apprenticeship program early on, um, but I started to notice that women weren't making it through the screening interview. Um, and then I started to notice later on when we were um, hiring um, that women weren't making it through um, our interviews. So I started to look at the ways we were um, asking questions, how we were existing in the room. So I noticed, you know, we do the standard whiteboard interview and the interviewer, you know, would go into the room, sit down, fold arms, blank face, and then the person being interviewed would be basically standing up there, not getting any, you know, feedback from the interaction at all and, and be completely intimidating. And so I think that what the person doing the interview was really trying to do was figure out if the person they were interviewing was smart and didn't realize that they might be um, kind of tainting the interview and, and causing the person to be uh, more nervous and, and not bringing out their actual problem solving skills or personality. So if you think about it, if you're working with a client, um, you're talking to them, you're interacting, there's body language, there's hand motions, there's smiles, and so it's really easy to kind of see if what you have suggested as a solution is, is resonating well or not. Um, and that's what you should be testing for, right? Not um, how, why our manhole covers round. Like those kinds of interview questions are, you know, that are meant just to stump people don't feel um, authentic. Um, they don't feel like they really, they test for anything. And, and furthermore, they do uh, leave people feeling like they're imposters and they shouldn't be there and they're intimidated. And, and women carry that burden quite a bit more. Although I do find in engineering, men also feel that way a lot. Sure. What do you think, like, as I'm a software developer and I've been at this a year, two years, or three years, and I want to, like, grow into maybe being a team lead, maybe being a company founder, like, what are the skills or what are the things I can do with the, like, position I'm in to start practicing and building that stuff? How can I, like, kind of apprentice under my leadership? That's a really great question because I think as a developer, it's... It can seem like you want to go into management um, because that maybe that's the only next step to grow in your career. And I, I would encourage you to look at uh, places or encourage your employers to have you know two technical tracks, which is what we had, you know a management track and an architect track, so that you can still advance in your career if you don't want to be a manager. But you know some of the things that you can start with are like can you run uh, the project inceptions or can you be responsible for stand-ups and or you can you um, you know do a lunch and learn we had Monday lunch and learn where you organize um, topics and so even just small things like that can give you a taste of you know what it feels like to to just be doing emails and meetings for a little bit and see if you actually want it try it yeah it's, it's great um, <laughs> one of the like top tips that I feel like I give over and over and I'm sure uh, like hopefully you've seen this from our people is make it very easy to say yes right I think what um, when you're when you're kind of in the employee tier it's easy to imagine say like I should get paid more Ingrid should know I should get paid more or I'm working too many hours she, like I should get some time off and from the management side you're like I'm dealing with all these other problems. I'm not like brainstorming what your problems might be, right? And so worst case, you get no feedback. Uh, second worst case is what I call like info turds where they're like, I'm burned out. <laughs> and then it's now up to you, like, fix me, boss lady. Uh, do, yes. Like, have you worked on kind of like coaching people through that kind of thing, like how they provide feedback to you? That's actually one of my weaknesses because when people give me their... Um, turd. Info turds, info turds. I just completely go into fix it right away mode. I think you know a lot of women can be in that uh, role, and it's it takes me um it's taken me a while to practice. You know, like don't respond immediately and ask. You know, what what can you do? You know, what do you think we should do? Some of those things. I mean, it can be easy to like. You know, we think as engineers like, you know, there's. A, a problem with variables and life is like that too so which variables do we have to change 
Um, and a lot of times, I, what, one of the things that I felt as a leader is that people would come to me expecting me to be the solver of the variables or me, me being the reason that everything was broken. Just make them do it. And so, yeah, so, um, and so that was certainly a frustrating part of, of running a company or being a leader is that you come from feeling like a teammate with everyone and everyone's really um, you know, self-sufficient to then get, you get to see this other side where suddenly people don't take ownership of things and don't have accountability and you're just like, and they expect you to have all these answers and you're just like, what just happened? Good stuff. And people are nice to you, and you're like, why are they so nice? Oh, I'm the boss. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, my wife is a social worker, and whenever I come home with problems, and I'm like, that Chad Fowler is like such an <laughs> asshole. And she'll, over and over, we have the same conversation. We've had that conversation like a lot of times, specifically. <laughs> but uh, we'll have the same conversation over and over, where she'll say to me, like, number one, what was your role in creating the situation? And it's like, uh, can't it just be that he's a jerk? And, and, so, and then she'll say the same thing of like, well, you can't control his choices. You can only control your choices. So if you don't know what you're doing to create the situation, like no change is possible. And it's just like, yes. okay, right? And I think one of the, to me, one of the like transitional pieces of going from um, like a employee who's producing to an employee who's like incredibly valuable is figuring out like how you control the situation, you know, and like how do you how do you create the situation for you to be successful? Uh, as we kind of like wrap up, you've chosen to kind of change change the situation. Uh, what made you choose? So uh, after how many years? I mean, I started in 2010, so yeah, like yeah, six, six years, half six and a half yeah. years of quick left decided to uh, yeah. be acquired by Cognizant. Yeah. Now Cognizant Quick Left with a job title with a comma in it, as we established <laughs> last night. Yeah. Um, why? Well, well, a lot of reasons. Um, you know, there's never just one reason. But one reason is that running a consulting company is really hard. Um, client, you're dealing with people. It's clients. It was going to be so fun. It was going to be the three of yeah, us. And then we had exactly. health insurance. And then... <laughs> And then things get real. Um, cause, yeah, it's a lot of, it's, your, it's customer service. It's a customer <coughs> service job. Um, so it's hard. But then there was also things changing in the market. Um, you know, as I kind of alluded to earlier, um, the delta between developer salaries and our billable rate were st was starting to shift. Um, we're almost a victim of our own success, right? You know, we're getting paid really well as developers, um, but in, especially in this geography, clients w were wanting to pay less, so our hourly rate actually kind of went down. And they want their cake and they want to eat it too. They don't want juniors, they want you to be on site. Um, so there was a lot of these things that just weren't working in the market. And it's something, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, I've run into these things the whole time, where market shifts, language shifts, whatever pivots we, we had done, but um, I was also pregnant with twins, and it didn't, you know, it was, it, it was really difficult for me to get pregnant, so I didn't really want to, like, mess it up for some business, um, and so I, I kind of looked at, uh, you know, our choices. Could I f fight for it, shift with the market, um, and I made that decision that I didn't want to do that. Um, the other variable was that we had merged with a product company called Sprintly, which is an agile project management tool in 2014, and that brought with it a whole other set of like corporate mess, um, including a cap table and investors I had never met. And so really I had this kind of, you know, internally broken uh, structure, corporate structure that also was adding to, to the, you know, do I want to fix what we're going through in the market and do I want to deal with this, you know, kind of crappy uh, corporate structure I was now in. And it was so, effectively like all on your back. And that too, and my co-founders had left, you know, one had left pretty early on and then the other one um, had left more recently. And so, yeah, I was the last founder left and I didn't join, I didn't start the company to be a solo founder. I'm not a solo founder kind of person. I'm, I am a collaborator. And so, so yeah, there was just a lot of different things. And, um, um, and so when I was on maternity leave, um, I was, having conversations with companies and taking my girls out to lunch because they would sleep all the time and talking deals. So as that woman walking downtown Boulder on Pearl Street with a stroller, doing a deal. <laughs> but I couldn't tweet it at the time. I was, 
Like, this is so awesome. But. If it was, if I was in your shoes, I feel like I would be on Pearl Street on my thing, just being like, by the way, I'm fucking selling a company. Yeah. Right here, right? And I'm I pushing totally a stroller, yeah. you know, boss level. Um, <laughs> was Quick Left a success? You know, I think to your earlier question about do I feel pressure being a woman in tech, that the sale was like the only thing where I was like, dang it, I think I might be failing women in tech. But um, I think it was, you know, I got a lot out of it. Um, a lot of, you know, I've grown a ton. Um, I got to meet a lot of people. You know, when we had to put together our due diligence, I had to go through and make sure every single person we'd ever hired had a signed, uh, you know, employment agreement. And we did. It was really, I felt really good about that. And we had a lot of people that had worked at Quick Left. And um, my first reaction was like, oh my God, we had a lot of people leave Quick Left. But my second reaction was like, you know, we had a lot of people that um, we really mentored and have amazing jobs. I mean, we have people at Twitter, we have people at Netflix, we have people at Instacart, um, Slack. So, you know, I think, and people have made lifelong friendships. So I think Turing, I'm just gonna throw it in there. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. yeah Turing, yes, you took my people back. Um, so I, I do think it's a success, um, but at the same time, you know, so my friend uh, Mara Abbott got fourth place at the Women's Olympic Road Race. At the very last minute at the finish line, she got passed by three people. She was by herself for most of the race, and then at the last minute, she got, I feel a little bit like I got fourth place um, in the Olympics of businesses. You know, it wasn't the exit that I had hoped and dreamed of, um, but, you know, I didn't, like, have to declare bankruptcy or, you know, you know, have all these mortgage my house or anything. But, you know, I have, you just, you have high standards for yourself. Um, at the same time, though, I think I feel very lucky that I can make this choice where I have this phase of my life that I want to focus on with my family. And I, had, I was able to make the choice of selling and getting myself into a place with Cognizant where um, it's very um, comfortable for what I need. Furthermore, it's, it's hardly different um, in my office. We're still working on really great projects. In fact, um, Cognizant has a billion dollars to invest in internal. Did you say energy. a billion yes. dollars? It's a very big company. Um, to a billion dollars? <laughs> <laughs> the second half of the sentence is really good, too. I should yeah. show up. So they have a billion dollars to do. To invest in innovation over the next four years. Internally. And so, internally. And so we are starting a startups program. And so we, um, I am going to be running their mentor programs with being kind of like tech stars um, in a big company. But then my team gets to, uh, we're going to be the, the startup studio. We get to work on all of these um, startups. So we still get to work on Greenfield, awesome new projects, um, but we don't have to worry about sales and, and all of the stressful things. Um, our culture is, is the same. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's a lot of things outwardly that look very successful but I do feel like I got fourth place at the Olympics. Not perfect. Yeah. Back to true and false. Uh, did you learn a lot? Yeah, true. Uh, over like 50 people had their careers like accelerated through your leadership? Over 100. Over 100. <laughs> true. true. Uh, did good work for clients? True. Not always. I mean, you know, but true. True. It's true. Uh, so we'll let them tell you. Like success? True or false, y'all? True. True. Yeah. So... Thank you, Ingrid. Um, we're going to transition to lunch. First, we'll give Ingrid a clap. Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs>